Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. Welcome to our show, The Voice of Islam the dynamic and spiritually stimulating show about Islam. Brought to you by Muslims who believe in the Messiah, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian. The Ahmadiyya Muslim community has tens of millions of Muslims for peace in over 200 countries. Our motto is, love for all, hatred for none. My name is Mariam and I'm here with my co-host Ayman. Assalamu alaikum Ayman. Wa alaikum salam. I'm looking forward to an hour of real talk about Islam's beliefs about real issues in everyday life. For our listeners who want to learn more about Islam and its pristine teachings through the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, you could go online to trueislam.com, that's T-R-U-E-I-S-L-A-M.com. You could also check out our Facebook page, Voice of Islam Radio Show, and for those who would like to talk to someone and ask questions directly, call the number one 866 why Islam? That's one eight six six. Why Islam? You could also email us your questions and comments to Voice of Islam Radio Show at gmail So, since 1889, our community has condemned all terrorism and strives without violence to establish peace and educate the world about the two true teachings of Islam. We will be with you for the next hour of real talk on Islam, and we felt that a great topic to discuss today would be the role as women as nation builders from an Islamic point of view. Yeah, so let's start with defining nation building. What is a nation builder? Well, nation builders are those members of a state who take the initiative to develop the national community. So when we talk about our nation, there is a different feeling attached to it. It's different to when we just say our country. It feels more personal because a nation is built from the people that live in it. And so nation building really starts from within ourselves. In other words, we the people as everyday citizens living, working, studying, even interacting with each other, we play a major role in building our nation. That's right. And in Islam, women play a vital role in building society on so many different levels. First, of course, the woman plays a key role in building her home as acting as a caregiver yeah. for her family. And of course, the importance of this role should not go underestimated. And we'll discuss that in greater detail later in the show. But it goes beyond that. She also plays a role in building her nation and community as a citizen. In other words, Islam requires that I, as a citizen of this country, must play a role in building and improving my society. Exactly. The footprint that we leave in our communities, it sets a tone for how this nation will run and what course it will take. So before we jump in, I want to actually start with a quote to quick kick off our show today because mm -hmm. it kind of sets the scene um, for today's topic. So our present caliph, His Holiness Mirza Mansour Ahmed said, as citizens of any country, we as Amdi Muslims will always show absolute love and loyalty to the state. Every Amdi Muslim has the desire for his chosen country to excel and should always endeavor towards this objective. Whenever a country requires its citizens to make sacrifices, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community will always be ready to bear such sacrifices for the sake of the nation. His Holiness continued explaining, We feel pain and distress when a nation suffers, and we share the grief and pain of others. Thus, whenever any country faces difficulty, we try our utmost to alleviate their suffering. That is what the founder of Islam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be on him, has taught us. It is thus that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is involved in spreading humility, love, and kindness. And those are very humbling and powerful words from our Caliph, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed. Um, if we want to live in a well-functioning society that leads to success for everyone involved, then we must take on the responsibility of being active members in our nation. So one key aspect of building a successful society is to lead by example. And where needed, take on the actual leadership role to solve problems and move forward. Most definitely. And in fact, within Islam, we see many examples of women in leadership roles. 
Even from the early days of Islam, women were showing example of exceptional courage and leadership. The wife of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be on him, whose name was Aisha, used to educate large groups of followers from the teaching of Islam. Safiya and Nusaiba were among female warriors who fought in battles against the pressures and to uphold justice. And those are really great examples, Amen. Um, they were showing leadership skills in societies that generally didn't even accept women mm -hmm. on the same level as men, never mind as leaders. And of course, that was before Islam came and revolutionized the rights of women. Mm -hmm. So those women were real trailblazers, you know, in history. Definitely. Nowadays, it's more common to see women leading and driving initiatives in most sectors of society. And Muslim women are right there, standing alongside them, shoulder to shoulder, striving to make the world a better place. A wonderful example of this is actually through the Ahmadiyya Muslim Women's Auxiliary. It was first established in 1922 in India as an independent, empowered women's organization, and now there are more than 70 chapters worldwide. Its main objective is to promote the development and progress of women and provide them a structure through which they can serve God and the community. So the aim of Lajna Maila, which is the name of this women's auxiliary, is to encourage women to strive together to enhance their knowledge and spread the knowledge that they have gained to others. And that actually leads us to our first guest, who is Dia Bucker from Zion, Illinois. She has been the president of the National Ahmadiyya Muslim Women's Auxiliary for, th for the United States since 2018. She is married and is a proud mother and grandmother. Assalamu Sister Dia. Thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today. Oh, okay. So I think we're having a slight technical issue. We will have her on as soon as we can. Um, but meanwhile, um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the goals of Lejna Maila. So if you will look in the United States, we have chapters in every city. Um, and they're normally, then they're run by Sister Dia Bucker from a national point of view. There are lots of initiatives and they help with social work, they help educating women, they help women in their trade and industry. So sometimes you'll have women who didn't quite get around to getting further education. Mm -hmm. And then later on in life, they, you know, they want to use the skills that they have mm -hmm. to either help their families or just to, you know, fulfill that need they have. Mm -hmm. And Lajna Amala is really awesome with that. Um, and have you had a chance to work with um, our local chapter of Lajna Amin? Yes, I have. And actually, it's very, we have our, we're always meeting locally, and it's just empowering for women. We always just encourage and uplift each other. And that's just one of the beautiful things about it. Um, There's a great feeling of sisterhood, right? Exactly. And I feel like it's really empowering when um, women work with women. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that happens. And, you know, I wonder once Sister Dia um, joins us, I'm sure she can elaborate on that. Mm -hmm. But when you're not kind of, competing for that you know this is my place and mm -hmm. i need some respect when women are together i just feel like it really brings out their maximum potential right and it kind of helps them strive and make each other better mm -hmm. and it's not to say women don't work with men they still work alongside them but what i've seen from the way lejna and milo works um they work in a way where they're independent they get the best out of themselves and then they work hand in hand with their brothers um yes. you know within our community mm -hmm. and together we i feel like it brings out the most in everyone of course yes it brings up our maximum potential yeah and um i feel like what i've seen over the years um lajna and Mila, you know you go there with a, a religious purpose you mm -hmm. come to the mosque because you know in our religion in islam we're taught to um strive um, because of our love for God for the mm -hmm. betterment of the community mm -hmm. but so we start in a religious aspect right so we we start to we go pray we learn about religion but then it goes into our practical life we do social work mm -hmm. through Lajna and Mila. we help with food um, banks mm -hmm. there's blood drives regularly mm -hmm. and I, I really feel like throughout my life from a young age I've always felt very empowered that we're not like, you know, answering to men mm -hmm. up above. It's kind of, you just see women from the top down and we're all working together. Right. And um, a lot of the time it starts from the age of 15. 
Um, that's where Lajna and Myla starts. And before that, there's a, another organization called Nasirat, and mm-hmm. that's for the younger girls. Right. So I think we have Sister Dia on the line. Um, Assalamualaikum, Sister Dia. Are you here? Uh, Wa alaikum salam. Peace be unto you. Peace be on you, too. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you today. No problem. Um, so let's just get straight into it. Eamon, do you have any? Yes. So the first question would be, what would be the purpose of establishing a women's auxiliary in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community? So um, first I'd like to give a little background that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community uh, women's auxiliary is an international organization that was founded December 25, 1922 in Kadian, India. And later in 1935, it was established in the United States, and we held our first convention mm-hmm. in uh, 1950. So um, to your point to what is the purpose, mm-hmm. so the purpose of our organization, um, by virtue of its name, means that we are an association of women who feel that we are servants of God, mm-hmm. uh, belonging to our greater organization. And with that, you know, we uh, commit ourselves to serving humanity as well as uh, serving our uh, religious community. That's that's really great. It's, it sounds, um, it's like on the point I was making before, that we, we draw on our love for God and our faith to then serve our community, and it becomes a really practical way of worship. Um, do you, yes. Yeah, so that's that's awesome. And a large part of the women's auxiliary um, is service work, as we've been saying. So um, can you tell us a little bit about the type of community services the women's auxiliary provides? Oh, sure. So um, our organization uh, consists of um, females, uh, Ahmadi Muslims, from the ages of 15 and older. And then we have our uh, younger members who are from the age of 17 to 15. And we're spread across the United States in 66 chapters, and we have over 8,000 members. So with that, we collectively um, work on projects together um, in theory, but, you know, physically we're in um, different states across the country. (laughs) So we have been involved in um, creating... Uh, book fairs and health fairs, um, we participate and organize blood drives, we are volunteering in schools, we're holding peace symposiums and other interfaith events to unite um, uh, individuals from a diverse perspective of religion and also ethnicities and bring us together under the banner of uh, unity. And we also um, currently are focused on uh, this voter registration drive, which one of my secretaries will go into a little more uh, detail about. And then we also focus on educating our members, not only uh, morally and spiritually, but helping them um, find uh, life skills. Uh, We provide scholarships um, for them to go back to school or to enter school. And we also have um, our own health program to try to promote um, healthy lifestyles uh, within our own members so that we have the energy and stamina to help the community at large. <laughs> it sounds like you really touch on a little bit of everything. How do you guys have time to do all that, all, your, your team? Yeah, well, only <laughs> with the grace of God do we have time because we are homemakers. We have uh, families, young children. We work in a secular uh, society, and we're also uh, attending schools. So it's a challenge, but uh, again, uh, we pray to our God for his help and um, to, for him to increase our capacity, and uh, we're able to you know, do the things that I have described. Yes, exactly. So what kind of work has the Woman Auxiliary been doing during the pandemic? Yes, yeah, so the pandemic created a you know a unique situation for everyone, um, with particularly sheltering in place. So mm-hmm. that kind of put a, a stamp a stamper on um, our activities in the community. However, um, we partnered in the past before the pandemic with other social service agencies, and therefore when this p- pandemic occurred. There was a great need initially for face coverings, you know, to prevent um, the 
continued spread of the virus. So we partnered with one organization in particular, Humanity First, um, and the members across the country, um, they stitched and sewed and packaged and mailed uh, over 15,000 face coverings to needy uh, organizations in the communities. And we're still doing that. In addition to we're holding food drives and distributing um, packages of food from our mosque um, and uh, other locations uh, to help those individuals who have been um, impacted by the coronavirus. And that's wonderful. Um, I think during this pandemic, we've really seen the importance of everyone in the community pulling together. And it sounds like um, the Women's Auxiliary really is doing their part. Um, and so as head of the Women's Auxiliary in the United States, what advice can you offer women who are looking to be nation builders like you are? Well, um, at first, uh, I don't consider myself a nation builder, <laughs> but I'm trying my best, you know, to um, improve upon my own personal qualities. And with that, try to mentor um, other individuals to look within themselves and uh, find um, their passion. And I think, number one, you have to have a commitment and passion for serving humanity um, and then uniting humanity and also believe in supreme justice. And with those three qualities, it keeps you on the path of ensuring that all your actions and, and you have a conscious um, uh, attitude about helping. And whether you're doing it individually or you're joining in partnership with other people, the, the ultimate goal is to always serve. And in addition to our unique role as being um, women, you know, whether we are um, uh, raising our own children or mentoring other children, uh, that's an important aspect of nation building, that yes. we embrace um, our innate nurturing ability to give that moral uh, fiber and mm -hmm. strength and, and a compass to our youth so that they become the adults in society that can lead mankind onto the right direction. And um, with that, I, I like to think that we build the, the nation by starting within our homes and within our communities and then expanding um, into the in encounters that we have. And we pray that we have a good um, role model that people would want to emulate and we follow the role models that, um, you know, the prophets, all the prophets, have given to um, the various dispensation of people uh, over time. Right, and and as you mentioned before, we um, you have members um, in the auxiliary all throughout the U.S. Um, so how do you um, how do you manage to keep that sense of sisterhood when some people don't live that close to each other? What what does auxiliary do to try and keep that bond going through? Right, right. So I was just having a conversation with a, a group of sisters virtually, um, like we are doing now, for, well, whether it's radio or um, conference calls or it's online meetings, and that even though we may not see each other, we can hear each other's voice and also feel each other's passion and love. So that's one way that um, we maintain that uh, degree of sisterhood by maintaining some form of uh, contact. The other is with activity. You know, the more you work, um, the more you form relationships, you're on the same goal, you're, you know, you're working on projects together, and it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. And from our, um, our particular teachings, you know, there's uh, two um, what we call sayings from the prophet is one that we're mirror images for one another. And that again goes back to nation building. And um, so we each try to model that good behavior that helps uh, build a community. And then the second is that, you know, we want for our brothers or sisters what we want for ourselves. So as we continue to develop and, and uh, progress and advance, 
in our own personal lives, we should want to help other people along those same paths. So um, that kind of inspires each other. Um, and it keeps our connection as uh, sisters. Yes, and those are really inspiring words. Yeah, of course, especially during this pandemic, it's so important to stick together and help each other, empower each other, and make us like feel good. So do you work with any other social and religious groups for interfaith events in the country? Oh, yes, and each state and each state has uh, various uh, smaller chapters of our organization. Um, they um, identify different um, community organizations uh, to work with. So I'm currently living in Zion, Illinois, mm -hmm. so we partner with this organization called the Northern Illinois Food Bank, and with Humanity First, then we try to hold uh, food uh, distribution um, activities on a routine basis. Um, other places have their uh, own uh, organizations that they are associated or affiliated with. Some are the real prominent ones across the country like Catholic Charities or um, uh, the Boy Scouts of America or the Girl Scouts of America. Mm -hmm. And some are areas that, you know, is very unique to that particular uh, area. Yes, and um, just the last question we have for you, um, Sister Thea, is um, as, I mean, in the show, we're talking about women as nation builders and, you know, how they can get the most um, out of their their potential. Um, and recently studies have shown that um, when women work in a female environment, they really shine. Do you feel like you've seen this um, in your work with Lajna Imaila? Because with the Islamic tenant, men and women work separately. They don't mix. So do you feel like you've seen this? Um, could you repeat the question? I, I didn't hear the first part. Oh, sorry. No, I was just um, mentioning that there have been studies recently that have shown that women really kind of shine when they're in a mainly female environment. Do you feel like you've seen this with Lajna Imaila? Um, because it is a women's organization. Oh, yes. So I'm smiling right now <laughs> because um, a couple of things I, I, I feel personally and from observation, we shine whether we work with a female group or a male group. Because, again, as I mentioned, um, uh, there are a lot of us that have secular jobs who are physicians and teachers, engineers and um, accountants. And so our environment is mixed. And with that, we're still able to, um, as you say, shine in our own professions and our um, examples for um, secular members, mainly not only because of our um, uh, secular education and the skills and experience we have, but because of our religious foundation, we bring something else into our um, work environment, which is a strong, uh, again, I'm going to use the term moral compass mm -hmm. and uh, a base from, again, the term supreme justice so that we stand and we promote and we, you know, fight um, for justice in our environment so that everyone feels inclusive and there's no um, prejudice and and we try to dismantle any um, biases or uh, racism or, um, or other uh, things that are obstacles to the um, uh, pursuit of what our um, secular constitution says, pursuit of happiness mm -hmm. and prosperity. Yes, exactly. And thank you so much, Sister Dia, for your time today. You really gave us so much information to reflect on. Yes. And it's a great introduction to the wonderful work done by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Women's Auxiliary. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. And you, too, are doing a wonderful job <laughs> in representing the not only the women in society, but our community, too. So I applaud what you're doing and uh, pray for much success in your endeavors. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. You're welcome. So part of the reason why we even thought to talk about nation building this week is because we have a very important election coming up in less than three weeks. 
and all of us as citizens of this nation must play a role in voting. The other reason we felt this topic was relevant was that in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, the vital role of women as home builders has really been brought to the forefront. Yes, and a woman wears many different hats or hijabs <laughs> <laughs> from daughter, sister, wife, mother, just to name a few. And mothers and, mo and women in most societies, including the United States, are often caretakers. Yes. This role shouldn't be as underestimated. Right, and in our last um, show last month, we discussed in great detail the importance of the role of mothers and female caregivers. We could easily have a whole show just discussing all the ways in which they set the tone for a person's whole life by nurturing them in their childhood. And in fact, the second caliph of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community said that at best, men can reform one generation and make them righteous. However, it is women who have the capability to revolutionize entire future generations. Yes, and what's amazing about that quote is that it was said sometime before 1965. Wow. And its message is continued today. Um, in an address to the entire Ahmadiyya Muslim community, our current caliph, His Holiness, had said, Remember that the key for any nation to thrive and progress lies in the hands of mothers of that nation. His Holiness's words are really interesting. I mean, you would think um, off the top of your head that politicians or wealthy business um, men or women or people with money and power, they're the ones who control the direction of a nation. But His Holiness reminds us that the mothers of a nation are the ones molding the future generations, so they're extremely important. I agree. And the mothers or mother figures are raising the people who will make up the future nations. So our future teachers, our future scientists, and the future politicians. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, our parents are our first role models that we have. Right. And studies show that all children, both girls and boys, who grow up with positive female influences, they're benefited. Girls tend to grow up to be more confident women who are more likely to strive in their goals. And boys grow up to have more respect for women generally, and then they have healthier relationships. Right. And this is just one of the ways that women can affect their communities. Other ways could be through various local community work in many capacities. Mm -hmm. And our next guest is actually going to go more into detail about this. Yes. Um, so our next guest is Aziza Faruqi, who is the current local president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Women's Auxiliary for the Austin chapter. She has been serving the community for the past 20 years, and by profession, she is a computer scientist. Welcome to the show, Sister Aziza. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you all the way from Texas. Well, yes, wa alaikum assalam. I've been listening offline, and this is such an interesting show. Oh, I'm <laughs> glad. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. We, we love the topic, too, so we okay. had to, to bring it to light. Mm -hmm. And there's only so much we could get in one hour, so we'll just jump right into it. Yeah. So as president president of Women's Auxiliary in, of the Austin chapter. What do you think is so important for women to be involved in the nation building? Right, so, you know, I was thinking about uh, the nation building has so many different connotations. And I was thinking about the topic and, and I came to the conclusion that, you know, you can never do uh, nation building from outside. Mm -hmm. It has to be done from inside because of Super Bowls have tried doing nation building from outside, and that never worked. Really. Correct. So, yeah. um, you know, once you establish that um, it's really the nation building is really building the character of the nation and strengthening the nation as a whole, you we can't uh, take women outside of this responsibility because we have more than fifty percent of the world population. Like right? we have to play a major role in it. So. I felt that we can be influencers in our personal capacity yes, uh, or have a positive impact uh, collectively under uh, maybe an organization like, uh, you know, Vishnu and Maiva, and work collectively to do that. Uh, the other thing that I felt that, you know, we have emphasized the role of, of a mother in actually raising the children and uh, kind of building the, the, the future of the nation. Mm -hmm. But but if you think about it, I mean, we have not every woman is a mother, right? Right. Correct. So, mm -hmm. so there, there are in any role, in any stage of the life that a woman is, 
do we have the capacity to positively contribute to, uh, to nation building? Definitely. Right? And, I mean, it's, nation building definitely starts uh, from home, but it doesn't stop there. Correct, yeah. I mean, if, if you are a mother raising consciously of your children, teaching them right from wrong, um, is a form of nation building, really. Exactly. Uh, and if you're a wife, encouraging your husband to do the right thing is nation building, <laughs> too. Yes. <laughs> Um, we call it ripple effect, call it butterfly effect, but the tone that is set at home expands to our society, our community, and ultimately uh, to the whole nation. And that's how we influence uh, a whole nation and kind of build the character of the nation and build it stronger. That's how I see. No, I completely agree. And in that same um, you know, line of thought, what are some of the things that your chapter is doing in Austin to nation build or help their community? Right. So we uh, have a mantra here. <laughs> you say, uh, be aware and be engaged. So our um, efforts at the uh, women auxiliary level, uh, they are multi-pronged, but, but really geared towards this, this mantra, that um, we try to educate uh, our members, uh, and at the same time, enable and empower them to 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 to, to be active participants in the in the uh, in the nation building activities. So we have a whole gamut of programs, from you know raising conscious awareness to community service to health and fitness. Um, as the um, Sister Dia had explained, that you know uh, there's a whole structure of uh, uh, Naila. Uh, and we have these monthly meetings, mm -hmm. and really, it's they are uh, uh, kind of. I mean, they, they are kind of a mix of education as well as uh, religious education as well as current affairs. Mm -hmm. So we, in our meetings, we discuss current affairs and uh, different societal topics, and uh, and then we just don't stop there. Uh, we participate in other um, kind of uh, activities with allows us to engage outside of the community. And basically the whole idea is to encourage um, constructive engagement and really letting our voice uh, be heard. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we are, I feel really pride in is that we have built a whole army of young writers wow. uh, who write letters and op-eds in response to current affairs and you know to remove misconceptions about Islam and Islamic world and and other current affairs that really do actually uh, impact it. Wow, that's um, amazing. In it, it, yes, and, and this is, uh, we were, this was really, we didn't uh, think that it was going to be so successful. But it, it started with a very small group that then suddenly, like, uh, not suddenly, but over the time, mm -hmm. we really built an army of that. <laughs> um, in addition to that, you know, volunteer work is always there. Um, is always the highlight of our community engagement, and we're constantly uh, engaged with either our adopted shelters or, you know, other uh, uh, charitable organizations. That's amazing. Um, it sounds like um, from yep. the, the meetings you were saying you were having every month, it sounds like it's a way for the women to come, touch base at the mosque, meet each other, and kind of refresh and invigorate themselves to motivate themselves to be um, better participants of community. Would Would you feel like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is, it's really the, um, the place where we build sisterhood mm -hmm. and we amplify each other's uh, energy. Right. Uh, and that there's one aspect that I, I just wanted to mention one thing that um, I feel that uh, we are doing something that uh, somehow we, we started doing it and I felt that we were on the right track. Mm -hmm. And that's empowering our young girls. Yes, of course. And it's so important so we, to make them feel empowered, especially to be involved in the part of the community. They're our future. So, mm -hmm, of course, they are our future. Um, so do you think it's important for women to, of different organizations to collaborate together when it comes to nation building? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, I mean, if you think about it, uh, we are uh, kind of a salad bowl, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, d different, um, different ingredients. Uh, yeah. but with the same purpose of providing nutrition. That's a great and imagery. That, I like the imagery. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, we, because of our uh, 
uh, our goal is same. We're all working towards making a stronger, peaceful, soulful nation for ourselves and our children. We can really amplify each other's efforts. We can learn from them, and we can um, really either either invite them to participate with us or be engaged with them. Mm-hmm. So we have uh, at least one sister organization that we uh, constantly work with, um, and this has been over twenty years. So this is a long-running relationship. Mm-hmm. And, and this is, uh, it's at Jamaat level, it's church without walls, but we uh, more closely work with the women wing of that organization. Right, and I feel uh, like it, it, it ties back to what you were saying as well about the youth um, being the future, and I, I think we can learn a lot from the youth because at school and in colleges, they really kind of lead the way and show us by example how to work together. Um, do you, do you feel that way too? We can learn from them? Absolutely. I mean, uh, we, you know, when, when I was talking about uh, basically empowering these young girls. Yes. We, we have uh, these, I mean, we, all that we have to do is just providing them the tools. And the tools are like strong value systems, give them the confidence, and give them a strong connection with community. Mm-hmm. And then what, that gives them the training wheels to, uh, to become really uh, strong nation builders. And what we found was that once you find the passion in, in these girls, they will take, take it all the way. So just to give you an example, after George Floyd incident, we could see the passion and their energy was just bursting out. Mm-hmm. And, and, we, uh, and we, we, I felt that we need to capture it because just that they had um, channeling it to the, uh, correctly benefited us in the long run. Because we allowed them to, we, we actually uh, uh, requested them to educate us. And they gave us the uh, presentations, uh, and they became, became really t- took the wheels off of a Supreme Justice Initiative. Oh, that's um, amazing. And that, exactly, that fulfilled their um, the need to have a space uh, to be acknowledged and to, to share and to, be, to uh, show their value. And for us, we felt that we were immensely educated. Mm-hmm. And again, until you know, with, in the election season, they are really taking the leadership role. I mean, the, these girls, they have, especially the girls who have just turned 18, they're just bursting with, <laughs> with pride. That's wonderful. And that's so important that they, they have that appreciation for their nation and they appreciate diversity and they're empowering all. Um, it's very inspiring to see, especially younger generations, be so involved and so passionate about these projects. Yes, definitely. Um, and Absolutely. also, we just wanted to thank you so much for giving us so many great ideas about how everyone, no matter what stage in life they're at, they can get involved in their communities in a positive way. And we really look forward to having you back on the show soon, thank if, you if so you'll come much. back. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. Absolutely. It's always a joy I'm speaking really to you. The show. Thank you very much for inviting me. <laughs> thank you thank so much. You. Yes, so you've definitely given us, we've gotten so many excellent perspectives and viewpoints from both of our guests already um, and how important it is to have the diversity in our society and come together as one. Right, and especially with what Sister Aziza was saying, you can really see how much women make a difference and when we come together, we can make any changes happen where they're needed. Exactly, and I would like to bring up a quote from a personal role model of mine, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Ruth Bader Ginsburg has said, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. Yes, and it makes sense considering that just in the United States, women make up 50.5% of the population. So by excluding women, you're only really getting half of the in point, uh, input and point of view. Um, I, I, the way I see it is it's like trying to see clearly, but only with one eye open. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it is better for society as a whole to have both perspectives, not only from men, but women as well in all sectors. Right. Recently, a report published by the UN said that achieving the goal of equal partnership of women and men in decision making will provide a balance that more accurately reflects the composition of society and is needed in order to strengthen democracy and promote its proper functioning. Yeah, and it even has positive benefits to the economy, and that benefits everyone. Then one study found that companies with high percentages for female inclusion are 35% more likely to have financial returns above the industry average. Mm -hmm. 
And that's because gender diversity is a pr proven asset. Right. That's really interesting, but not completely surprising. Yeah. The more diversity in a group, obviously, the more perspectives you gain. Right. It makes a lot of sense. And I think it's great to see n more women coming up in business as well as local and federal government. Of course. And I know you're familiar with the saying, be the change you want to see in the world. Yes. Whether it be through little victories or monumental change, it's through our actions and our words that we could better the society. Um, our actions and voice change anything from env environmental justice to racial just justice, and we could mold the world we want to live in for our future generations. Definitely. And um, one obvious way to do this is through voting. Yes, and to all of our listeners, please make sure you're registered to vote. This only takes a few minutes online. Everyone needs to have their voice heard and every vote counts. And with that being said, it's the perfect time for me to introduce our final guest for today's bro broadcast, and that is um, Sister Shazia Sohail. She currently serves as the National Director of Public Affairs for the Ahmadiyya Muslim Women's Auxiliary in the United States. In the past five years, she has helped organize and mentor women to build relationships with female leaders at local, state, and federal level of the U.S. government by highlighting their shared value of loyalty to nation. Um, Assalamualaikum, peace be on you, Sister Aziza. Uh, sorry, wrong guest. <laughs> Sister Shazia, <laughs> how are you today? Peace be on you. <laughs> Uh, it's so um, great to have you on the show. And as Sister Dia, our first guest, said, she was excited to have you on to talk about voting. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I, I, well, let's just jump right into it since this is a topic fresh in everyone's minds. Um, so with an election year, um, it's an election year. It's a huge election. Everyone's talking about it. Does Islam have anything to say about voting? Well, thank you so much for inviting me to present the Islamic viewpoint on the electoral process. You asked about voting, which is the hallmark of a democratic system of governance. Let us first look at what Islam says about democracy. The Holy Quran clearly puts forth the idea of democracy as the most preferred form of government, though it doesn't rule out other forms of government as being irreligious. The Quran prescribes two principles of governance that are present in successful democracies as well, and leaves the rest to the people to decide. The first is absolute justice, and the second is consultation. Now, consultation is a principle that contains within it the notion of representative government that we call democracy. And the general public gives its opinion through the agency of vote. We find guidance uh, regarding voting in chapter 4, verse 59 of the Holy Quran, where we're advised that a person should only hand over trust to those who are entitled, mm -hmm. and that when judging between people, we should make our decision with justice and honesty. Now, why? Because Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, taught that love of country is part of faith. So mm -hmm. loyalty to one's nation requires that the power of the government should be given to those who are truly entitled to it, meaning who are best qualified to hold it, so that the nation can make progress and come to stand at the forefront amongst the nations of the world. So votes should not be cast on the basis of personal preferences mm -hmm. or personal interests, but Islam teaches that a person's vote should be exercised with a sense of loyalty and love for their country. A person's vote should be cast with the betterment of the nation in mind. Mm -hmm. The person should not look at their own priorities and from which candidate or party they can personally benefit. Instead, a person should make their decision in a balanced way, mm -hmm. whereby they assess which candidate or party will help the entire nation to progress. The keys to government are a huge trust, so they should only be handed over to the party that the voter honestly believes is best suited and most deserving. Does mm -hmm. that answer your question, Maria? I think that was beautifully put, and I, I think I want to like listen to that again I afterwards. <laughs> it was very well said. Um, no, 100%. So from what you're saying, it is clear that Islam places a lot of importance on voting. Um, a lot of our listeners might think that their vote doesn't count and that their d 
democratic process doesn't change anything. Does Islam have anything to say about this? Now, this is again an excellent question because the same could be said of every collective effort where human beings are required to work together in large numbers to bring about change. Mm -hmm. Why should we recycle? What good is the effort of one person in reversing climate change? Why should we give charity? What good is the effort of one person in eradicating poverty? If we allow ourselves to think in negative terms, then nothing would get done. Negativity is a function of despair and hopelessness. And the Holy Quran not only condemns it, but also uses powerfully inspiring language to combat it. Mm -hmm. It challenges its readers with lofty principles and then promotes them comprehensively. For example, it demands unconditional justice in chapter 5, verse 9, and I quote, O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in equity, mm -hmm. and let not a people's enmity incite you to act other than with justice. Be always just, that is, nearer to righteousness and fear Allah. Surely Allah is aware of what you do, mm -hmm. unquote. So we see that so valued is the concept of absolute justice that it's intimately tied to one's righteousness. Quran does the same with all other moral values. Mm -hmm. for, voting, uh, for voting as well, we find language like, and I quote, verily Allah commands you to make over the trust to those entitled to them, and that when you judge between people, you judge with justice. And surely excellent is that with which Allah admonishes you. Allah is all hearing, all seeing, unquote. So if we feel that the democratic process doesn't change anything, then perhaps we are not acting with justice when casting our vote. The solution lies in changing our action rather than giving up altogether. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. No, it does. And I think it's um, a great attitude to have regarding our vote as we go into this upcoming election because it can be very hard. Sometimes people feel dejected, but it's it's a great attitude, attitude to have that we need to make the democratic process work and you can't give up on it. Exactly. So, um, yeah, is, is there anything we as women and citizens of this country can do to make the voting process better? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you again for an excellent question. Islamic teachings regarding exercise of goodness extend equally to men and women. We as women can do everything that men can do in this regard. Mm -hmm. So women would look toward the Holy Quran and example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to find guidance just like men would. We find that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, joined a pact called Alliance for Absolute Justice, whose oath was that they will help those who are oppressed and will restore them their rights as long as the last drop of water remained in the sea. And if they, meaning the oppressors, did not do so, they themselves would compensate the victims out of their own belongings. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was 15 years old and the only youth to participate in the Pact Alliance for Absolute Justice. All the other signatories were tribal elders, and he was faithful to it throughout his life. So under the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA banner of Alliance for Absolute Justice, mm -hmm. the women of our community took up the responsibility for making sure that not only they themselves should be registered to vote, but their husbands, adult children, parents and other household members should be registered to vote as well. Mm -hmm. We are also planning to get the vote out through early voting and mailing in ballots. I think the women in our community are fairly energized to participate in the electoral <laughs> process due to a renewed understanding of our responsibility in this regard. Um, does that answer your question, Mariam? Yes, definitely. <laughs> With that being said, does the work of the Alliance of Absolute Justice benefit everyone in society, regardless of faith or background? Yes, absolutely. I mean, remember this pact was formed in the pre-Islamic era, mm -hmm. long before Prophet Muhammad peace upon him received divine revelation or prophethood. Justice is the only yardstick to be used to help people. 
So folks who are interested can find out more about it at absolutejustice.us. When you go on the website, the first thing that pops up is volunteer with our national partner, Power the Poll. This year, we are heavily focused on getting people to sign up as poll workers because historically, senior citizens formed the majority of volunteers as poll workers. This year, due to COVID-19, they might not come out in as large of numbers. So we're asking the youth to sign up to volunteer. Mm -hmm. So once again, the website is absolutejustice.us. And that really ties in actually with what um, Sister Aziza was saying about the youth being the future. They really are coming out and using their voices, coming out to vote when they can, and you know, hopefully be poll workers too to really make this democratic um, society work. So I, th I think that's wonderful. And um, of course, for the um, those of our listeners who'd like to get more information about um, the Alliance for Absolute Justice, um, again, the website is www.absolutejustice.us. Thank you so much, Sister Shazia, for your time today and for your insight. It was a really great conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for having me. Thank Have a nice you. day. You Thank as you. well. Yes, and thank you to all of our guests today. They, I feel like we've gotten such valuable information to take home with us. And yeah. for our listeners out there, we still do want to hear your thoughts and questions. So again, you could email us at the Voice of Islam Radio Show at gmail.com, or you could call one eight six six Y Islam. We would definitely love to hear from you. So, Miriam, do you have any final thoughts for our listeners as we come to the end of the show today? Yes, actually, um, I feel like, you know, our guests were so great. They really give us a well-rounded idea of how we can make a change in our society. Um, and um, we've discussed so many aspects um, mm -hmm. when it comes to nation building and being a member of society as a whole. Um, from locally to nationally, there's so many outlets where our voice can be heard. And this is really motivating. Um, and I think it really, another thing that's really stuck out to me from some articles I was reading recently was how important it is for us to learn about our local government. Exactly. Sometimes mm -hmm. we get so caught up in the national vote and the presidential vote that I think with the pandemic, we've really mm -hmm. seen that our local government, um, that's where all the decisions that actually directly affect us. Yes. That's where they're made. So exactly. I really encourage everyone to learn about um, all the local um, candidates that you're voting for, all the propositions. And, um, yeah, you really be like educated Most on definitely. everything, you know, not just checking off anything on the boxes. Exactly. And I think it's a reminder of how voting is a right, but it's also a privilege and we really have to use that privilege. Yes, exactly. Most definitely. So thank you to our listeners at home. Please be sure to tune in every Saturday from two to three. Next week's show will be very interesting as we will have a representative from the League of Women Voters. Now make sure you tune in. Thank you so much for listening and may peace and blessings be with you. Allahu Akbar, Allah.